Hello, everyone. Good to see everybody. Uh, let's start off with some prayer, and then we'll get right into our uh, in our lesson. Um, just want to give you an update too on um, Jim Lothian. Uh, Brother Lothian is is not doing well, and um, has been moved to a to a hospice unit. So um, be praying that the Lord would just be merciful. Um, he he is I think just about done. So if you all could just be praying for him and for Miss Barbara. Uh, next several days is going to be really tough. No matter which way things go, um, it could be kind of you know, just just really kind of weighty. So uh, let's pray for them. And let's pray for ourselves as we get into our lesson tonight. Uh, I know you all are tearing yourselves away from watching impeach impeachment hearings, right? So <laughs> let's let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you for your word, for your truth, for your love for us. We ask you, Heavenly Father, speak to us tonight. Teach us your word. Give us grace upon grace to understand more about you out of the Old Testament. Father, we pray right now for Brother Jim Lothian. Father, we pray that your mercy would be upon him. Father, that great grace would surround him, Lord God, that he would see the end of his faith. And Lord God, I just pray, Father God, that there, he would have no pain and that, Lord, he would just have your spirit just surrounding him continually and strengthening his heart, strengthening his innermost being. And Lord God, give him and Miss Barbara special faith, special faith for this moment in time in their lives. Father, we just praise you and give you glory for what we're going to learn tonight. We lift you up in all honor in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Can everybody hear OK? Let's get started because we've got a lot of ground to cover tonight. Um, we where we left off last week, I think, was right on this slide here. It's in Genesis and we're, we're going to be probably in Genesis for a little bit um, because there's a lot of types and shadows in the book of Genesis um, and, and a lot of information in, in the book of Genesis. I mean, you just. Don't run out of, out of information that is a type and shadow of not just Jesus, but we as believers. And uh, and we can see how the whole plan of God really we, we can see the whole plan of God laid out in the book of Genesis by itself. We wouldn't really even need to, to look elsewhere. But there, there is a lot where the Lord confirms so many things that we believe and gives us really information that is uh, is amazing information as we go along. I'm trying to get my light right there. There we go. Maybe I don't look so bleached out. Um, so let's take a look here. Genesis 1, verses 11 through 13. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Now, is it just me or is there a coincidence that all of the stuff, all the green stuff was created on the third day and Jesus rose the third day? You know, because Jesus is life. And and that life is clearly represented on the third day in that that's when all the green stuff was made. That's when all the herbs and trees and fruit and everything else came into existence. Now, take a look here. As we we look at uh, Genesis 1, 17 through 18. And God set them in the firmament in the heavens to give light on the earth. He's talking about the light. Um. To rule the day, to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So in Genesis 1. Let me get it, get to my my place here in my in my scriptures in, in Genesis 1. Um, God divides the light from the darkness and he after this is now this is after 
he created all the green stuff. Um, God said that let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens. And so God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light to the earth. Now we're talking about stars, moon, um, the, all the different things that project light to the earth. And people, you know, we don't, we don't understand the, the infinite wisdom and knowledge of God. Everything that we see out there is light up in the sky. Um, and, and I know that they say, you know, well, it's coming from, you know, millions of light years away. And those, you know, those stars may not even be there today. Um, we don't we don't really know because we can't get to them. We can't see them. We can see some things with the Hubble telescope, but we we don't really know uh, how far away all that stuff is. And we we don't know if they're planets, universes. I mean, we, we're taking a lot of good scientific guesses, and I have to believe that some of that is right. But still, we, we see scientists and they're they're predicting things and saying things, and they really don't know because they're not there. And what they do know, though, and, and they keep um, I think for years they, they denied this. But the universe, and indeed, everything that's out there we call space. Um, yeah, that's right. His first use was for signs. Let, let there be lights in the vault of the sky. This Richard sent us here. He said, and let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. Yeah, you're exactly right. And and God set them up there for us so that we could navigate by them, so that we could get around by them, so that we could know the times and the seasons by the stars and, and that are up there in the, in the atmosphere. And um, until recent times, they thought the, the universe was a, a finite thing. But now they know that the universe is infinite. It just keeps going. And going and going and going, and so we we know these things. Uh, we who who study the word, but if we look at Jesus and we look how these things represent Jesus, um, Jesus is indeed the light, and there's no end to the light. Um, and God set Jesus in the heavens to rule over the the figurative night and over the figurative day. He also lays out an example for us here that light and darkness should be separated. Now, maybe we hadn't thought about it this way, but when when he comes in and he says, um, God divided the light from the darkness, he didn't intend for light and darkness to be mixed. And in fact, he says that light overcomes darkness. So in 2 Corinthians, take a look here. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Now, here Paul's asking the question. Can we have, can we who are of the light have communion with people who are of the darkness? And then what does the darkness represent? Well, obviously, God intended from the beginning to separate the light from the darkness and the darkness obviously was not something that was um, th that was good. So we see here. Yeah. Ed, Ed says wickedness. Yeah. It, it represents a couple of different things. And let me go to the next slide. Darkness in the scripture scripture represents a number of things, including ignorance and evil or wickedness. Evil is a state of the heart in which one is separated from light. Light exposes evil deeds and thus helps us recognize our own shortcomings. Now, Jesus, I was surprised at how much Jesus talked about light and darkness. Obviously, in, in the terms that Jesus talked about it, it is exactly what Genesis says. It, it, it is a separation of light and darkness. Truth from, from the lie. Uh, good from evil. I mean, we can go on and on and on about the comparisons. Jesus says 
in John 3, 19. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Wow. Now the light is Jesus in all of his perfection. His goodness and purity exposes our darkness, you know, the darkness of our heart. So, so what do we think? Why, why would we love darkness? Why would we love darkness? I mean, if we, if we, uh, if we have a basic understanding that darkness represents ignorance, why would we continue to love darkness? Come on, anybody, give me, give me some feedback. Yeah, Ed, Ed says nobody can see their their own actions. You know, our, our stuff is hidden away from us, right? Our, our stuff, our evil, wicked ways, the things that we do wrong, they're not exposed. Yeah, Nancy, good word. Pride. Pride. We, we I mean, it's unfortunate, but when you shine the word... Yeah, to had to hide your dirty deeds. Yeah, when when you shine the word <coughs> onto any part of us, if there is darkness there, even if we created the darkness, even if we are making the darkness continue, if you shine shine the word into that darkness, it exposes it. It exposes whatever's there. Now, the light, in that it's exposing it. The thing it should do is help us clean it up, you know. Um, it, it should put it in the place where where we say, "Ah, look there, man! I got to get rid of that." But unfortunately, um, th this is kind of a comparison I've used in times past, sermons past. Um, you know, somebody comes in and they flip the light switch on our our dirty room, um, and and then we look around at the dirty room and we point to the person who turned the light switch on and we say, now look what you did. That's kind of what happened in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, Nancy, that's good. Refusing to change. Nancy says refusing to acknowledge the need to change the heart. Yeah. Yeah. It, we we often do that. We we refuse to change. We refuse to acknowledge that that's our mess, and and that's because we are prideful. Because, and, and I think that was the darkness that was found in us is is pride, and anything that is um, not Jesus, anything that's not Jesus is darkness. If it if it can't be exposed to the Word of Christ. To, to the scriptures, to what Jesus said, to his principles and statutes. If it can't be exposed to that and be okay, then it's darkness. And, and it, we need to fix it. Now, i got a couple more scriptures on this, I think. Look at John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So we know then... Light produces life. Scientifically, light produces life. Um, Richard could probably tell us about photosynthesis and, and all that stuff. When we get light coming down, it, it, we don't even need that much light. And, and we get life produced. And <clears throat> I think if more Christians understood that, the more you expose yourself to the light of the word, the more life you get in you. When God divides the light from the darkness in Genesis, he's given us a picture of how we ought to live our life, separated from the darkness. Um, because truthfully, everything ought to be out and open in the light. Now, that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in Christian homes. It doesn't happen in Christian lives. It doesn't happen in church. But it ought to. And in our, our life... Um, should be directed in that path. I think it's it, another interesting uh, thing that I, I think you just kind of scratch your head and go, hmm, 
is that God created all the plant life first and all the um he he kind of had the whole earth populated and then set all the different markers up in the heavens the stars the moons the you know the the uh, the planets that would be out there to guide us that whether they were close up or, or far away God, God sets them up after he's created everything now they they rule the night just as Jesus rules the night we might not think that we might think well Jesus doesn't have anything to do with with the night no Jesus rules the night even though it's night <laughs> it's darkness he rules it look at Acts 26 in verse 18 he says this is um Paul the Apostle talking, he's talking to King Agrippa, and he's recounting what he learned or what, what he got out of when he got knocked off the horse, what Jesus said to him. And he says this, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So it's what Jesus tells Paul the Apostle and, and tells him that's going to be his mission. He's, he's going to go to the Gentiles and he's going to deliver them from darkness. Now, go back to those stars in the sky because they do relate. If we think about them, as Richard said earlier, they give direction, they, they, uh, they map out things. You, Pretty much, if you look up into the heavens and you follow the stars, you can get yourself just about anywhere. And I mean, ask a sailor, they'll tell you the North Star, they know where they're going, right? So the stars in the heavens are that which brings the word to us. The word coming to us, whether it's through preachers, books, it, it's the word of God coming to us gives us direction. It's a compass. It puts us on course. Without the word, we're lost. Without the word coming to us, we're lost. In the uh, book of Revelation, when it talks about um, he who holds the seven stars, and he says this, what the seven stars are. And he tells us that those, you know, the, 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 um, the stars representing the churches, the they're there to bring light. We're, we're here and we've got all kinds of places where light comes into our life. And it's there for the purpose of giving us direction. The same as the lights were in the heavens to give us direction. They're there for us to, to receive direction. So all of this stuff, I mean, we can just keep looking and, and seeing how amazing it is what God sets up. And it's all in the Old Testament scriptures. Now, let's take a look at Romans 3, 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. What's he talking about? What's he talking about when he says, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light? And cast off the works of darkness. And let's put on the armor of light. We're going to get rid of our... our like my dad said, dirty deeds, right? The, the, the things that are really, the things without the word. If light is the word, which is Christ, if light's the word, then darkness is everything that's without the word. It's all the stuff that, there's, that we do without faith. You know, whatever without, whatever is done without faith is sin. Yeah, Ed, when we witness somebody, we are bringing the light to them. We're, 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 we're ushering the light into them. And that light is going to expose, unfortunately for them, it's going to expose the darkness that's in their heart. Um, I can't remember the guy, uh, Ray. Oh, man, I can't remember his last name now. Uh, there's a guy that has a, a whole series of teaching about how to win people to Jesus. And it's actually really good lessons. And in one of the things he says is part of the questioning that he takes somebody through. And 
he he says, well, um, would you say that you're a sinner? After he's talked to him for a little, he said, would you say you're a sinner? And almost everybody says, well, yeah, everybody sins. I mean, if you're talking about the things that are perfect and what God has laid out, if, if I violated any of them, well, sure. I'm, yeah. yeah. OK. So, so you see you're in darkness. Now, let me tell you how the light can get rid of that darkness. And it, it's really truth. Paul tells King Agrippa that Jesus told him that he was called to minister the good news to the Gentiles. And he says, this is going to pull them out of the darkness. In Romans 13, Paul tells us to cast off the works of darkness. In Ephesians 5, 8, Paul tells us we were once darkness. He says, but now are you light? From the beginning of time, as we know it, from the beginning of the earth, of creation, this has been a, a, a common theme with God. And we can see it all through the Old Testament. We see it all through the New Testament. Light is the word. Light gives us revelation. Light gives us understanding. Light gives us um, the, the, the ability to, to see uh, the things of God. Darkness hides it. Darkness keeps us in hiding. Um, it's what Adam and Eve tried to do. Now, in Genesis 1, 26 through 27 says, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now, Jesus, who's referred to in the New Testament as the last Adam. And his earthly form is all man created in the image and likeness of God. Now, a lot of people say, well, well, he was created God. No, he, he was not created God. He had to be created as man. As man. He had to come in the form of the first Adam. So he had to be completely man. And yet he, he was born of the seed of, of the spirit. So if we if we think about this way, um, because, I, man, I, I've looked over this scripture a bunch of times and, and just thought, hmm, I, I wonder what this is saying exactly. You know what I mean? You ever get them where you say, man, I just wonder what God's saying exactly about this. It says out of God came both male and female. God created man in his own image. Man there means mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, I can tell you what some modern teaching and some people have said. Is that Jesus was um, both sexed. He was both male and female. If, if, if there was a Jesus, he was both. That's why he never got married. Eh, wrong answer. Good word, Richard. Nope, nope, and double nope, right? Um, but it is interesting when we take a look at this. The first Adam was created as all male. The first Eve was created as all female. Richard said he, he was the last Adam and also only the second Adam. There are only two recorded sons of God, Adam and Jesus. That's exactly right. Although he calls us all sons of God by adoption, but not by birth. Adam and Jesus are the only two that are born of God by birth. Adam created Jesus' birth. To the womb of a, of a woman. Ed says, why are we called, why are we called man, son of God? What, why are we called man? Because um, that, that's, the, the, the word man means 
it, it's got the uh, Hebrew root means red. Um, so we are a um, we're created out of God, and when he when he called out a mankind, or he, he said he made mankind. Um, in the Hebrew, I mean, we, we came up with an English word eventually called man. In Hebrew, it wasn't. It was Isha, ish, I think it's Isha. And and it um, if we take a look and we start thinking about God called, called them male and female. He created them male and female. Now, here's the, here's the question, though. When he created them male and female, that means if they were both created in the image and likeness of God, right? He, he didn't create one in the image of God and the other one not in the image of God. He created both of them in the image and likeness of God. Then what does that say about what's what's in God? Because I, I, I know we live in a sexist society, right? And and the you know, supposedly the scriptures are sexist and the People that wrote it were sexist and all that kind of thing. Richard says, when we accept the living Jesus as our Lord, then we become adopted sons. Yeah, that's exactly right. We become adopted sons. Um, yeah, because he said, let us make man in our image. Well, then, then is there a female God? Oh, Richard. Oh, man, you're getting into a scripture there, right? God calls himself the big breasted one. For, for some for some in our society, they would say, well, see there, that means God is the woman. And that's not true. God refers to himself continually as a he um, in, in the masculine term. Although there are a lot of Hebrew words that refer to uh, two different parts of or different things of God. As female in the feminine. Jesus isn't male and female, as some people would say. Now, here is the um, the account of creation tells us that Adam was not complete without Eve. Jesus, however, is a complete being as a man. He's created all man, but he's a complete man in that he's all man. Adam was an incomplete man without Eve. He had to have Eve. God said it's not good that man should be alone. And and it wasn't. Yeah, that was part of it. Ed, to certainly to replenish the earth. And it had to. Um. Richard said she was prophesied to be Eve, the mother after God said that her seed would bruise Satan's head. Exactly. So to begin with, that that was not, I mean, he, he did tell them. Yeah, Jesus was circumcised. That's probably proof positive that he was a male. Um, thanks, Dad. Uh, Eve was created and she was created though, in the image and likeness of God. So she had to have had attributes of God that Adam didn't have. And together, they were one complete being, husband and wife. And it says, the scripture tells us that when a man and a woman become husband and wife, they become one flesh. Am I right? So, the um, the Adam and Eve together were the complete thought, mind, um, heart of God. Without getting into that God was a male. Yeah, the expression. That's exactly right. They were the total expression of everything that God is. Just as Jesus is a total expression of everything that God is. Now. All the things that made Adam incomplete and wanting, Jesus had in completeness. Jesus is and was the perfect man, lacking nothing. Yet, yeah, but he was all male. 
we're the ones who pervert the scriptures for our own justification. I mean, we see it, we see it in movies, we see it in all kinds of stuff. We we pervert the scriptures for our own justification, which gets down to what Nancy said before. It's a lot of pride. Now, this had Adam and Eve being created actually had nothing to do with human sexuality, but everything to do with human completeness. We understand that. In fact, it wasn't until God had pronounced the curse over Eve that we find out she's going to deliver children in pain. Now, that we, we know they were supposed to deliver children because the Lord told them, go forth, multiply, and replenish the earth. That's what the Lord told them. But he didn't tell them there was going to be any pain involved in it. Any of you all that have seen a, a baby born, do you know that the woman goes through a great deal of pain? If we were, my dad says, if we were different, we could not. Yeah, if we, if we were, the, if we weren't different, that's right, dad. If we weren't different, we could not replenish the earth. If there wasn't a male and a female, we could not replenish the earth. So God created them that way. But God did not create, when, when they were going to procreate, it was not going to be in pain. The pain came after the curse. Now, Jesus, through the person of the Holy Spirit, makes a full man. And he makes us full. <laughs> there you go, Nancy. If male, male and female were in the makeup of the creator, then his creation of us as separate had to be a picture of our dependence upon Christ for wholeness. Yeah, Ed, that's true. That they, they were. They were perfect. Uh, until they until they fell under the curse, but pay attention to this last last line. If male and female were in the makeup of the Creator, then His creation for of us as separate had to be a picture of our dependence upon Christ for wholeness. You guys get that? It's that is already a type and shadow. You're right, Dad. Pain is a reminder where we come from and that and of our humanity. And then who saved us? And and that that is really think think about the whole picture there of the creation of male and female, man and woman. And they sin. And they sin. Now God says to the woman. You're going to bear, when you bear children, it's going to be in pain. When Jesus did the redemption for us, when Jesus went to the cross for us, God bore children now in pain. The pain was in Christ. Totally. Jesus absorbed all the pain on our behalf to be born again. Yeah, Richard, you took all the pain. Just like God told Eve, okay, now you've sinned. There's going to be pain in bringing forth children. God tells Jesus, now they've sinned. There's going to be pain in me bringing forth children. It's all going to come through you because you're going to bear all the pain. And, and the whole thing is a picture. It, it's it's a picture in Ephesians um, 5 when he talks about the husband loving the wife and then the, them having children. It talks about children in the same context there in, in the last part of Ephesians. Um, when it talks about that and they become one flesh and they they are um, they're totally one being. Is what Ephesians 5 tells us. And he says this is just like. Christ in the church, the husband and his bride, just like Christ in the church. So just as we are dependent upon Jesus as the church, the body of Christ, we're dependent upon Jesus. 
the um, it's a picture of of Adam and Eve being dependent upon each other. There's a lot in here, isn't there? Take a look at Romans 8, verse number 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, our new birth places us into the place of the first Adam. We're not the first Adam, but it, it, it puts us back to that place. We're, we're not going back to be like Abraham. I mean, I, we are, I know we're heirs of, of Abraham. You disagree, Richard? Okay, tell me why you disagree. All right, tell me why. Because we are, yeah, we are a new creation. We're not, we're not, we're not created. And maybe I, I should have explained more of that. Um, we, we are not created in the similitude of, of the first Adam. Um, because we, we don't have the ability uh, to fall again. Once, once born again, we don't have the ability to fall. Even, even, if, even if we do sin, which we all have. But now, think about another type and shadow. Um, Cain and Abel, right? Cain kills Abel. Then Seth comes along. Seth is a type of us. Born again us. Um, Seth comes along and Eve says about Seth, see, the Lord has given me another son, right, whom Cain has killed. A replacement. But Seth is a better replacement. Seth is a better replacement than Cain. Well, that, that's kind of we're we're going back, and, and Richard, maybe this is where I where I got you messed up in my thinking. Um yeah, she did. She did think Seth was going to bruise the devil's head. Um she she wasn't looking out way long in the future to Jesus. But let me um let me help you with what I was going to say there, Richard, because I, I needed to add more clarity to that. Um, how God created us, he, he created Adam in a certain way. Adam is a type of Christ. And when he created us, we are not going back to the place of Abraham, which is, I've heard that taught a lot in church. Well, yeah, we're heirs, you know, of Abraham. And we're heirs of the promise of Abraham. And we all go back to Abraham. Well, we were never intended to go back to Abraham. Abraham was a flawed man. Yes, we are to have the faith of Abraham. Yes, we are to inherit the promises that Abraham had. Yes, in our humanity, um, there's there's a lot where we are uh, we are to take that that spot where Abraham had. But that's not the intent. The intent is that God created a new creation in Christ. Adam was a new creation. Adam wasn't an old creation remade. Adam was a new creation. We are supposed to be a new creation, not a remade creation. And, and we start over where Abraham left off. We are a new creation in Christ. We, we happen to have attached to us all of the promises that God promised to Abraham that came by faith. Yeah, he was created a little lower than the angels. Exactly right, Richard, is what uh, Hebrews tells us. I think it's Hebrews 2, that he was created a little lower than the angels. Uh, and the risen Christ is above all the angels and no longer lower than the angels yet. And through Christ, the angels become our ministering spirits. They, they are our ministering spirits. So although they were created above us originally, above mankind originally, they were to minister to mankind. They were to minister to Adam. And 
through sin, which, by the way, came by a fallen angel, through sin, um, Adam loses a lot of the privileges. Yeah, Richard, exactly. So we're new creations above the status that Adam had. But we are like Seth. We come in the place of. We're not, we're not Adam. We're in the place of Adam. And, and so we, we pick up a position that we, now think about this, what he says in Romans 8, 9, 8, 29. He also predestined whom he foreknew. So all of us that are born again, God foreknew you were going to be born again. He also predestined. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. Not to, not to be, um, how do I say it? He didn't predestine us to work up to his son. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. So, so because God predestined us, and we're going to be conformed, that conformed, that is a, uh, a Greek word that uh, re refers to a, um, something that is, that is produced, and it is, um, it is formed of a proprietary um, formation. The, the hand of the proprietor, the, the person who made it, has the say-so over what it's going to look like. That's kind of what that word, that word conformed in the Greek means. It, it means that the pro proprietor or the, it's a proprietary um, design. In other words, like an iPhone is a, you know, Apple doesn't give those. It doesn't just let anybody have that technology. Uh, they have a proprietary thing. You can't just put all any parts you want into the Apple computer. You know, it, it won't work. The. Everything of theirs is proprietary. Well, when when we get born again, we become a proprietary or the uh, yeah, we are a proprietary creation. Only God has the ability to fix us, change us, move us, conform us. And he's doing it all into the image of his own son. So that he could be the firstborn of many brethren, many brethren means Many like him in the same status as him. Obviously, we're, we're not Jesus. And we we uh, fall way short, I would think. But we are being born again into that proprietary mold that will eventually be the image of the Son. So in uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, look at this. And as we have been and as we have borne the image of the man of dust. Now, what happens to the man of dust? Talks about that in the book of Genesis. Once again, types and shadows. The man of dust. It's, it's this body, physical body, which returns back to dust. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So if anybody's worried about, you know, um, unfortunately, I've had to talk about this quite a bit here lately. Um, with our seniors, um, we we spend our life in Christianity, believing for heaven, hoping for heaven, wishing for heaven, can't wait to get to heaven. And then when the time comes around, that is going to happen for us. We wail, cry, don't want it to happen. I mean, we're conflicted. But the truth is that we're going to bear, we, we already bear the man of dust, the image of the man of dust, because we have a physical body and we're on the earth and our bodies are not perfected. But we're also going to bear the image of the heavenly man. Hallelujah. Because we, we can't wait to shed this body, right? Yeah, he was upset, Ed. He, he knew he knew exactly what was going to happen. But he was upset. He wailed. Yeah. 
And he cried. That's exactly right. And dad, yeah, you do have to embrace it. And and you do because you know it's coming. You know it's going to happen. And and it's going to happen to every single one of us. Um, and Jesus knew it was going to happen. And the thing that he that was the worst part for Jesus was that he was going to be separated from his father in that instance of time, that moment of time when all the wrath of Almighty God is poured out upon Jesus. He's totally separated because of sin from his father, because his father cannot even look upon sin. Yeah, he died death. That's exactly right. He died death. He died physically and spiritually. And so he became separated from the source of life. Well, thank God. In bearing the image of the of the heavenly, we will never be separated from the source of life. Now, our bodies may perish. But our spirits go on instantaneously. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, they go on and they are transformed. Yeah, Richard, exactly right. Only because he rose again. Had he not risen out of the grave, none of this would be possible. Ed says, and the ones he was with were asleep. Yeah, they, they were. They were all asleep. But they were, they were asleep spiritually, too. They couldn't understand it. Blinders were over their eyes. Um, and, and they were going to live in heaven. Or in hell, right? They, they had a choice. But after Jesus rose from the grave, was seated at the right hand of his father, crowned king of kings and lord of lords, it was then possible that every man who would believe on him would have everlasting life. Look at 2 Corinthians 3.14. But their minds were blinded. That's what happened to Jesus' disciples. Their minds were blinded. For until that day, this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. We have the ability to see into the things that Moses saw on the mountain with God. As God spoke to Moses of his son, Jesus, because that's what happened for 40 days and, and 40 nights. He's up there on the, you know, uh, Moses is up there on the mountain with God. Well, they're not sitting around having tea and talking about their latest golf game. You know, M God's telling Moses everything to do about the redemption of mankind. You say, well, how do you know he did that? Because all of the things that Moses lays out about the sacrifices uh, uh and we're going to get into that as we get into Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. We're going to get into some of those things. All the things, I mean, every single thing that God told Moses about that tabernacle in the wilderness. Every single thing. Yeah, and about the high priest. Exactly right, Richard. And, and, about, um, and about how the sacrifices were going to be done. And, uh, you know, about the, the, the labor and the washing uh, bowl and the you, you know the table of incense and and all of those things all are types and shadows of Christ and our redemption yeah and the purification by blood God goes and lays out detail after detail after detail to Moses and then tells Moses to go down and do it and Moses remembers it all in 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 I mean, just magnificent detail. He remembers it all. And and here, here he is. He's got all this coming to him. And he still had a veil over his face and could not understand what God was talking about. All that detail that we now have access to. Eddie, I bet Moses was a genius. Take a look at 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all... We all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So, if Moses was a genius, Ed, what does that make us? If we, if we all, with an unveiled face, we're beholding in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. We're seeing the glory that Moses wanted to see. We are seeing it. And we're being transformed into that same image. 
Exactly, Rich, Richard. Moses, Moses was the meekest man on the earth, no doubt about that. And, and I believe that's why God chose him. And we do have the mind of Christ. We do. Yeah, and I think in a lot of ways we, we are. Because, listen, the word says in, in 1 John that the, uh, the spirit that the Lord gave us will teach us all things. Jesus said, told his disciples, he said, everything that I've told you, the Spirit's going to bring to your remembrance. How many people can remember everything somebody told them? Much less, you got, you got, uh, <laughs> yeah, and he, he is pretty smart, isn't he? Jesus is pretty doggone smart. Now, now, think about this, though. Jesus tells the disciples, and at the time there's 12 of them, all the things that I'm telling you, the Spirit is going to bring to your remembrance everything. He didn't say, hey, most of the stuff you guys are going to remember. He says, everything that I tell you, all the things that I tell you, the Spirit is going to bring to your remembrance. Now, if you took 12 people today, pick any 12, 12 people you know, pick the smartest 12 people that you, you can think of. Sit them down in a room and teach them nonstop without recorders, without film, with, without any type of recording devices or anything like that, they're not even uh, allowed to have a pen and a paper. And, and just sit them down. Richard, I know it was three years, but just think about it. You sat them down for three hours. Twelve of the smartest people that you know. Sit them down for 12 hours or three hours. And speak to them nonstop for three hours. And then ask them the next day, what did I tell you yesterday for that three hours? Tell me verbatim what I told you for that three hours. How many of them are going to be able to do that? I, I would reckon to say none of them. Not any of them. The, the probability has got to be up into the millions, one to a million, millions and millions probably, of that happening. And yet here were, I mean, obviously Judas... Uh, took off permanently but here here's these 11 other guys and they go they go and they remember it all they don't remember part of it they remember it all now that's an amazing feat see why we need to study the old testament look at the things we're we're, we're learning and, and getting to know Moses went up on the mountain, and here's why we know it's possible, though. Moses goes up on the mountain of God, another type of Christ. But he goes up on the mountain of God. He comes back. God's been speaking to him for 40 days of his son. He comes back. He writes five books, the books of the law, the Torah, or Pentateuch. He writes those five books. Uh, dictates them to a scribe who writes them down for him. He cannot miss one thing when it comes to the sacrifices, one thing when it comes to the dress of the priest, one thing when it comes to the structure of the tabernacle in the wilderness. He can't miss one thing when it comes to how the Ark of the Covenant is going to be constructed. He can't miss one thing on any of the laws. What is the probability that Moses listens to God for 40 days and 40 nights, talk about his son and all the types and shadows of his son? He comes down off of that mountain and has complete recall of everything that God told him, enough to write into five books that men have followed for 5,000 years. That's amazing. It's amazing. And then here we are. We are going from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord, being changed in the same image. Uh, when man was created, he was covered with a veil of sorts. Now, this veil that was over Adam and Eve was the glory and innocence of God. Now, their sin brought down the veil, and they saw that they were naked. They became ashamed and tried to hide themselves from God. This dumb idea. Um, it was the innocence of Christ, Jesus, that kept them from knowing their nakedness. We find in Genesis 2 that God himself formed man 
from the dust of the ground and breathed into the man his own breath, which created life. God's original design for man was for man to live in the midst of his glory. God's original design. Man was originally designed to live in the midst of God's glory. God's glory is his complete goodness. Every part of God's goodness. Overwhelming God's goodness. Man was designed to live in the garden of God. In the midst of God's glory. I mean, everything provided for him. Genesis 131. Let's take a look here. Then God saw everything that he had made. And indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. It's interesting that God created man on the sixth day. Six, by the way, is the number of man. Six, 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 we know is the number of, of, of the Antichrist, right? From the book of Revelation. It's, it's man, man, man. It's man bodily, man uh, emotionally, mentally, and man spiritually. Jesus' number is seven, seven, seven. The devil's number is 666. He's man, man, man. Uh, it, it is interesting knowing that uh, on the sixth day, that he, man would really quickly fall in disobedience. Yet God still calls that day very good. And think about that. If dad, oh my goodness, if it wasn't for the apple and Eve, there wouldn't be there wouldn't be television. Oh my. <laughs> Think about this though. The he calls it after he creates them, he calls them very good. He knows they're gonna fall. He knows they're gonna come into sin, and he calls them very good. Now, God did that knowing he knew they were gonna sin. And he already had a plan. The word doesn't say Jesus was the secondary plan in case man sinned. It says Jesus is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth. The foundation of the earth was not, was not man inhabited. The foundation of the earth, man wasn't there. So God knew before. God knew before. Before we get to the point of man's creation, God already knew man was going to fall. And he had a perfect plan. Now, in Hebrew, uh, Hebrews 4, 3 through 5. Yeah, Richard just sent me a, a text that said uh, the Hebrew word for light in Genesis 1, 3. Starts with a left. And Richard, I wish I could see that. But I cannot. <laughs> Look in Hebrews uh, 4. Well, I'll tell you what. Before we get into this, because I want to get into the seventh thing, we're not going to have time to really do it justice. Um, I want to talk about his rest. And I want to start there next week, where I talk about God's rest. The, the rest that he would uh, give to mankind. Oh. Yeah, okay. Richard just gave me a a, um, a rundown. He sent me over in Hebrew a, a text of the, um, the Hebrew word for light in Genesis 1-3. And it means power and strength of God shining in the face of a man. So the power and the strength of God shining in the face of a man, which is Jesus. In the New Testament, even says that. It says it shines in the face of Jesus Christ. So another type and shadow of Christ in one Hebrew word. There is so much in this. And, and I want to, um, I, I really do want to get into this rest thing because there is a rest, that seventh day rest. Uh, and Hebrews talks about it, and it is a rest promise for the believer, and it's already resident in type and shadow in the Old Testament uh, in God's rest. 
And, and we need to take a look at that because we really need to understand that our life should not be a stress mess. Filled with bickering, fighting and anguish and impeachment hearings. It should be in, in all uh, non-joking uh, matter. It should be a life of peace and joy and, and just the pleasures of the spirit. So we'll hit that next week. Listen, you all have a great night. Thanks for a lot of really good feedback. Uh, blessings to every one of you. Uh, thank you for all the good input. And uh, y'all have a great night in Jesus' name.